Welcome to week three, module three, financial statement analysis. As we begin, I want to review again, there's a difference between financial reporting and analysis. This difference between accounting and finance, um, we all use some of the same information, but financial reporting is about providing financial information about an entity to a user. It includes financial statements and other types of reports and disclosure. So that's the accounting, the reporting. What we then do in the finance side is we analyze it. We use financial information to look at what happened in the past and to prepare for the future. Um, we use it for decision making. We use it to decide how to allocate our capital, our equipment, it enables us to develop plans and strategies to use to make salary, con salary decisions. So there is a difference. One is the accounting, which is the production of the numbers. Financial statement analysis is the use of the numbers. In a way, financial analysis is taking all of the information that we have from multiple different sources and putting it together to tell a story and then we get to create a recommendation as to the end of the story. When we look at the financial analysis of a company, it's important to look at our point of view. Now, we talked about the different roles in finance and internal users, those within the company, uh, use it for planning, strategic and operating plans. We'll talk more about that towards the end of the semester. Uh, it is for setting goals. How much? What is the goal? Okay. Um, evaluate profitability. Okay. Is each business segment, each product, being profitable? It's a way to evaluate management. Are they doing their job? Should they be compensated for that? Should they sell the business? Should they expand? It can be used to make pricing decisions. How much should we price a product at? It also gives us the opportunity to identify opportunities for improvement in the company. It can be used for determining funding needs. Where's money going to come from? Uh, determine appropriate capital structure. What's our mix of debt and equity? What are the components that we need? So those are what we use them for internally. They're used by those in the finance function, but they're also used by line managers. Line managers always uh, are being evaluated based on profitability. Are they achieving their goals? Okay. So I think that becomes, these are internal users. From an external user perspective, it's the first one is a lender. Uh, will someone considering a credit decision to lend to the company, they're going to want to lend to a company after studying the company and making a decision on the capacity to repay. We're going to get more into that as, as we move forward, but that's what the user is, the lender. Analyst. There's financial analysts who watch companies and make recommendations uh, as to buy or sell or other acquisitions to be acquired by somebody. The media looks at them. Uh, an investor, someone who owns stock in the company is interested in that and they're looking at it from a different point of view. Acquirer, somebody wanting to buy the company. So, I mean, if you're looking at the different purposes here, a lender, they want to get repaid. So they're going to look at it a certain way. Analyst is looking at the future and future profitability. Media, eh, you never know what they're going to look for. It's going to be the positive spin. Are there new developments? What is happening on the job front? Uh, investor, they're looking for a return on their equity to help them price out their investment. Acquirer, if somebody wants to buy them, they can look at that and say, are there opportunities for me to either get synergies with that company or be able to eliminate expenses? So those are the two different users, both from an internal and external perspective. Now, when we look at this, um, before we do any analysis, we have to understand why 
we're doing it. What's the purpose of analysis? Uh, you need to have a purpose because there's different techniques available and there's so much data. So you sort of have to say, why are we doing this? So in that case, the analysis really um, evaluates the historical performance of a company, a trend, cross-sectional, a prepare a forecast for future performance, value a company's equity or debt, and prepare a rating or recommendation um, within the context. So that means you've got to define who's the intended audience, okay? What's the end product? What's the time frame we're looking at? What are the resources and constraints? Based on purpose and context, formulate questions to be answered. So the first thing is, well, what's the purpose? Why are we doing this? Okay, Are we doing it to review our own profitability, develop our own internal plans to set goals? Uh, are we a lender looking to get paid? And I think we have so many different techniques, as you see, and in some cases, um, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, for example, a periodic credit review of, an, of a portfolio of, of debt. So say a company has issued debt. Um, it's pretty straightforward of what they're going to be looking at. And there's certain expectations of what will be in that. Um, so it's, it's really about looking at What's the purpose? But it helps us focus in an approach and what tools do we need to look at? What are the data sources? What are the format in which to report the results of analysis? And the relative importance of different aspects of the analysis because we have so much data that's available to us today. And as you've already seen, when you're starting to look at the 10K, all that information, um, how do we process it? Where do we go? Um, what would you do? How would you prioritize some of this stuff? So some of it is just uh, taking a look at what the, what's relevant for the decision at hand. You don't use every tool and every ratio all of the time. It's what you're going to be looking at. You know, when you got to look at who's the intended audience, what's the end product? Uh, is it a recommendation? When is it due? Um, and the context may define what you're going to do. And I think the next thing um, that as we look at this is once you get the purpose laid out, um, then there's specific questions that you want to ask. And that's what we're going to look at. And I'm going to go back and we're going to go through the balance sheet. After we go through the balance sheet, we're going to stop, take a break, then we're going to go over to the income statement, then we're going to look at tools, and then we're going to look at your third project. So that's the process this week. Let's uh, start off um, with a few more things. This is a holistic approach. we got to look at all aspects. we got to start with fundamentals. Fundamentals means we start with the basics. What is the financial information from financial reporting telling us? How do we take that information, start using it? Okay, it's more than just the numbers. Okay, it's not just creating ratios or uh, formulas. That that's anybody can do that. I can teach. We're gonna, you're gonna learn how to do that very quickly. But that's only a small con part of it. Starting to look at what does the company do? What's its strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats? Where is the company going? Where? What is the strategy of the company? That was our first assignment was what does the company do? What are their strategies? What is their competition? Without And what's the macro environment in which they are doing business? So we take that macro view that we looked at in week one, we look at where the, what's the company's products, its services, its customers, and we then look at their strategies. What are they doing to grow the company? 
because this is we're, we're, the things we're looking at are within that context, not just the numbers. That's the holistic piece. But we got to start with what are the historical results telling us? Okay, are there projected results? What's that telling us? Now, some of this is going to be a review. So let's start with the balance sheet elements again. Assets are resources controlled by the company as a result of past events and for future economic benefits are expected to flow. So it, the assets are a result of something that happened in the past. We bought equipment, we bought inventory, we sold product, we have accounts receivable. There's going to be future benefit. We're going to collect on those accounts receivable. People will pay us. The accounts receivable will be turned into cash. Inventory will be turned into accounts receivable, which will be turned into cash. Okay. Next one is liabilities. Obligations of the company arising from past events. Okay, and in this case, it's the opposite. Instead of cash coming in, these are going to require cash going out. So, in the first case of assets, we're going to get cash in from our accounts receivable in the future. For accounts payable, cash is going to be going out. So, an asset is when value or cash is going to come in. A liability is when cash or an asset is going to go out. Now, equity, in a very simple way, it's the difference between assets and liabilities. This is how much the owners have in the assets after deducting its liabilities. So that's equity. Assets equals liabilities plus equity. Or assets minus liabilities equals equity. Now, when we talk about uh, components of shareholders' equity, there's a number of things that go in there. Um, and these, again, we're down to a lot of terminology. Okay? And the first one is capital contributed by owners or common stock or share capital. Okay? Now, that's the amount that was invested in the company by its owners. In a corporation, as we saw earlier, uh, ownership is evidenced by shares of common stock. They may have a par value or a stated value or no par value. And that's dependent on the regulations upon which the company was incorporated. Now, within that, we may have um, different share classes. Now, there's disclosures for each class of share issued by the company. This can be found generally right on the face of the financial statement. And if it's not there, it'll be on the statement of equity or and or in the notes to the financial statement. Uh, and we'll hear what the par or stated value the number of shares authorized, okay? Um, how many can they sell? Number of shares issued is the number of shares that have been sold to investors. Now, we have common stock, okay? So there can be common stock, share capital, and that is number of shares issued or number of shares authorized, issued, and then outstanding. Okay, Preferred shares, which is the next category, uh, have rights. There's still equity. It's a step below debt, as we've said before. And in preferred stock, there's preferential rights given um, to the receipt of dividends and receipt of assets if the company is liquidated. Generally, it's considered to be equity. But there's certain things that give it quasi-debt uh, characteristic. Okay, Some of them are perper perpetual, non-redeemable preferred. Okay, They're simply there. Um, so that becomes an important thing to distinguish. Oftentimes, they will have a stated interest rate Okay, that's not tax deductible. Now, the next one, um, the wording used is 
treasury shares or treasury stock. But you might have heard a lot about this, and it's called buybacks. Companies have been borrowing money, and they've been borrowing money in order to buy back stock. Um, additionally, companies have been making money, and they don't see any reason to reinvest in the company. They can't find a good bargain. So what they've done is they start to buy back stock. Now, they could buy back because they think the shares are... Uh, undervalued. That's the big thing that people are buying their stock back because it just seems that's priced incredibly low. Um, but also, if it needs shares under a employee stock option program. So there may be times when a company needs to buy them back so that they can issue them to employees pursuant to an employee stock uh, agreement. Um, now, what happens is when you buy back this stock, treasury shares, shares or treasury stock, it reduces the, it reduces the equity. Remember the, the equations, debits always equal credits. So if I'm buying stock back, I am going to debit treasury stock and credit cash. Okay, so we're holding them in our own treasury they don't, uh, the dividends aren't paid on them. Uh, they're not included in the earnings per share number. So we, we have those. That's becoming a bigger deal. Now, for those of you that are accounting majors, and for one company specifically that I've assigned you, we'll see if you can see how this is applied. Um, then we have retained earnings, and that's the amount of earnings that have been earned in the past and have not been paid out, okay? Beginning retained earnings plus net income minus dividends equals ending retained earnings. But if the company doesn't pay out any dividends, it's the amount of net income. Now, the next one, okay. Now, this gets confusing. Um, and this is accounting rules. We don't need to understand for purposes of this class what it means is that generally everything runs through earnings. The accounting folks, generally accepted accounting principles, have identified certain things that are recognized directly in equity, reduce or increase equity, and they don't go through um, the income statement. And these are a lot of times set up relative to reserves, I meaning they're setting money aside for a purpose, and a number of other things. But we can see that on the statement. When we're looking at shareholders' equity, this is treated just like retained earnings. It adds in. Non-controlling interest or minority interest, uh, we'll see that. Um, so what we have when we're, we're looking at this um, is a company may not own 100% of the stock of a subsidiary. They own, might own 90%. So 10% of it um, is, is, might say, is minority. So that reduces the equity. Now, the equity, the balance sheet provides a lot of information about a company's financial condition. However, the balance sheet amount of equity, assets, net of liabilities, assets, less liabilities, should not be used to measure the market value of a company or the intrinsic value of a company's equity. Okay? That becomes um, very important. This is not market value. The balance sheet is a mixed model with respect to measurement. Some items at current at historical cost, some items at current value, but that's a historical cost. That doesn't mean what they're going to be worth in the future. Even current value reflects a value at the end of the reporting period. So that might have been a value if the company had a 1231 year end. We're already in June, so it's six months old, that value may not necessarily be there. Now, the value of a company is the future cash flows that it's going to generate. 
And that is a driven by a mix of items, not just what's on a historical balance sheet. Okay, so this is moving forward that there's a difference. Okay, but one is the financial reporting, and then the other becomes a market value of the company. We'll continue to talk about that. Now, balance sheet, uh, let's look at format. The first thing um, we, we look at is the word liquidity. Okay, For a company over its all, it's its ability to pay its short-term ob obligations. But remember, you've got to take this into account the working capital cycle, the cash conversion cycle, because we're an ongoing business. Okay, um, for a particular asset or liability, it's nearness of cash. Cash is one hundred percent liquid. Okay, and accounts receivable may take thirty days to convert to cash. Inventory may take longer. Okay, but when we're looking at fixed assets, property, plant, equipment, it's a much longer cycle to put that. Balance sheet ordering is based on whether you're in the U.S. or whether you're using IFRS, International Financial Reporting Standards. Companies using GAAP order items on the balance sheet starting from the most liquid to the least liquid. Now, when we look at European and IFRS balance sheet, it starts with the least liquid and it works its way down. Okay just so that you know there's a difference. You may find a company that has that, and that's why. Um, we look at current assets, and those that are expected to be sold, used up, or realized in cash within one year, or one operating cycle, which is ever greater after the reporting period. Non-current assets. Assets not classified as current, okay? Long-term, but think long-lived. They're not consumed in this operating cycle, okay? Current liabilities are those to be settled within one year or within one operating cycle of the business. Non-current, it's everything that's not current. Let's take an example, keep going. Uh, cash and cash equivalents, fairly straightforward. These are highly liquid short term, okay? The risk of change is de minimis. Demand deposits with banks, this is checking accounts with banks, um, savings accounts with banks, liquid investments, original uh, maturities three months or less. That can include U.S. Treasury bills, commercial paper, money market funds, etc. So those are cash equivalents. Uh, when we move on and look at trade receivables, which we've already talked about, sometimes we need to hear these things a couple of times uh, and to put it in the context of what we're doing. Trade receivables. You'll see trade receivable at all other receivables. This is where you as an analyst and looking at this have to make a decision. Trade receivables are often called uh, accounts receivable, and that's amounts owed to the company by its customers for products and services already delivered. If it has to do with the customer, it's a trade receivable. If it's with it's not from a customer for the sale of a product and service. It's an other. Okay? And it's based on, it's recorded based on approximation of fair value. So you have to look and say, how do we adjust for collectability? Now, under GAAP, you actually do go in and you'll say what, you'll take a look and say, what's the past due amounts, those 90 days, and you'll create a reserve for uncollectible. Okay, and oftentimes when we take a look at the balance sheet, we want to look at the level of accounts receivable relative to sales. How much have they set up for bad debt? What's the concentration of credit risk? If 100% or 90%, doesn't matter, of the receivables is from one customer, that's concentration of credit risk. Okay. Um, Taking a look at inventory. Now, remember, you buy goods, they go into inventory, and they become available for sale. So these are the balance sheet sides. But 
as soon as we sell them, they go into the cost of goods sold. Remember the flow. When we get into property, plant, and equipment, these are tangible. Touch them, okay? Under the cost model, property, plant, and equipment is reported at historical costs, less depreciation, and less any impairment losses. Depreciation is simply the allocation of cost over a asset's useful life. So when we look at Geneseo Coffee Company, their roasters will last five to seven years. Okay, uh, land is not depreciated. Okay, impairment losses do occur when there is an unanticipated decline in value of a long-term asset, and this is a, a permanent reduction. Okay, so that's property, plant, equipment. We have things called intangibles, and the measurement basis of non-current assets. Intangibles identify non-monetary, you can't touch them, okay? But these includes patents, licenses, trademarks. They have a value. Generally, value is created when it is something is bought, okay? Um, first one is if you're buying a business, and you're putting a business in with yours, um, you value all the assets, and this can include, if I bought a trademark, a license, or a patent, I can attribute a value to that. So when I buy a company, I look at what the purchase price is, I allocate the purchase price to any and all assets that are identifiable. They can be cash, receivable, property, plant, and equipment at fair value, patents, license, and trademarks. When I put them on the books, the difference between what I paid for it and all the identifiable assets, there's an amount left over. This is referred to as goodwill. It's not separately identifiable. You're buying it because of its ability to generate future income. Okay. Um, now, once you acquire a company, uh, you have to, for patents, licenses, and trademarks, they have a what we'll call a finite useful life. So a patent may be good for seven years. So you would amortize it over the useful life, and if it becomes worthless, you assess it on an annual basis um, when indicated. Um, now, intangible assets with indefinite useful life, you don't amortize but assess for impairment on a regular basis. Now, Valiant had a little problem with this um, earlier this year. Uh, when you started looking at it, they had this massive number of intangible assets. Okay, moving on to the um, current common types of current liabilities, trade payables, known as accounts payable, and that's the amount that the company owes its vendors for purchases of goods and services. This is the unpaid amount. Notes payable are liabilities owed by a company to a creditor, but there's a formal loan agreement. Accrued expenses, also accrued, accrued expense payable, accrued liabilities, non-financial liabilities. These are expenses that have been recognized on a company's income statement, but have not yet been paid. An easy example of that is payroll. Most payroll is paid a week or two weeks behind. So for the work done through May 31st, may not be paid until the following week. So that is an accrued expenses. We then have something called deferred income and or deferred revenue, unearned revenue. And this when a company receives payment in advance of delivery of the good, and so that can include deposits. But now, think about when you buy an airplane ticket, okay? You buy a ticket prior to flight. Sometimes you buy them a month, two months, six months in advance. The company hasn't earned that money yet. So it's called deferred income. They've got the cash, okay? But they haven't performed the service or delivered the goods, therefore it's deferred. 
some examples of long-term financial liabilities, loans, borrowings from banks, um, notes or bonds, which are fixed income securities, meaning the interest rate is fixed, uh, issued to investors. They're usually reported at cost. Um, and in some cases, what we found that outstanding bonds, um, fixed income securities, publicly held, at times can be reported at fair value. Um, next thing we have on a balance sheet is deferred tax liability. And that's the amount of income tax payable in the future with respect to taxable timing differences. And we're going to talk about that when we get to income. But that's basically the difference between a company's accounting gap method accounting and what is reported for tax purposes. And there's differences. Okay. Um, so that's the introduction to financial statement analysis and a re more in-depth review of the balance sheet. What we're going to look at next is the income statement. And from the income statement, we're going to look at tools. And from tools, we're going to look at project three. Please let me know if you have any questions.